My name is Nick Larivere, and I'm a member of our kernel development team. And I've been working primarily for the past year on Mathematica 9's new unit system. Uh, and so what I want to do today is give you a brief introduction to the unit system, the functions associated with it, and then look at some applications and some of the capabilities that the unit system has and why we think this is a good addition for version 9. So just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start by looking at the fundamentals of the unit system, the quantity head that we use, and why we use that rather than just having symbols for units um, and multiplying them, um, some of the functions that are associated with it, how we handle things like unit discovery and natural language, and how those tie into uh, Mathematica. Plug into the internet here. Um, and then we'll look at how it integrates with Wolfram Alpha and with various system functions in Mathematica. So for fundamentals, um, as many of you probably saw in Steven's talk yesterday, uh, our fundamental unit expression is quantity, which has a value and a unit associated with it. Uh, and we have a nice little display form where you get the short form and a nice tooltip. If you don't know what M represents, it represents meters. Uh, we also handle compound expressions from units. So we can have feet divided by seconds squared and we get foot per second squared. And we also handle, uh, the unit system not only includes units, but it also includes uh, physical constants such as Planck's constant. So we can get a combination of pounds and uh, Planck's constant. There are a number of basic unit operations we have that involve pulling out different elements of a, a unit. So we can pull out the units of moles per newton. We can also pull out the magnitude, which represents the value inside of the quantity. Um, and these have other nice attributes, such as we can express something that has units that would normally cancel out. We can actually take expressions like meters per meter and maintain those within the unit system. We also include some dimensional analysis functions, such as the unit dimensions function, which will pull out the physical dimension associated with the unit. Days, seconds, minutes are all measures of time. The speed of light is represented in terms of time or length divided by time. It's meters per second. And we also can look at larger expressions where we have compound units and physical constants associated, we know the actual dimensions that are associated with that, which lets us infer things like compatibility for addition. <laughs> Feel free to applaud at any time. <laughs> um, then we have functions that operate on units and, do, and make modifications to them. So for example, a basic operation is converting. We can convert 13.2 ounces to grams and we get a result immediately. We also maintain rational numbers wherever possible. So uh, in this case, rather than giving you a numerical approximation of the number of grams, we keep it in an exact value, which is very important when you're working with units because precision differences when you're doing something like converting light years into feet or you have decimal approximations, variance based on precision can lead to exponential amounts of error in your code. Um, and we support all sorts of different units. Here's a small sample of converting light years into feet, meters, surveyor's feet, which those of you in the GIS industry will know are very, very slightly different than international feet, which is what most of us know a foot to be. Uh, we can also have microns, astronomical units, uh, and we can convert not only to specific units, but also to unit systems SI, Imperial, Metric, and SI base units as well. So one of the things we've done, because a lot of people want to convert to SI base units because that's a standard practice when factoring units out during other operations or uh, in various different disciplines is to convert them to their SI base units. If you just provide unit convert a single argument, it will return the SI base units associated with that. Um, so the canonical form of units will always be plural, but one of the things which I'm going to demonstrate in just a moment is that uh, we have built-in interpreting functions for quantity that allow you to specify things in a form that's familiar. And I bet, all right, so in this case, it went off 
because it's not the canonical unit form, we actually went and interpreted that. I could also replace that with a capital F and uh, degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. So there's some bit of interpretation that goes along with it, but I can use lowercase and we'll interpret that as farad as well. Uh, and again, we can convert explicitly to SI base units or look at the SI base units associated with uh, the physical constant, the standard acceleration of gravity. Uh, we also have a function called common units, which will use heuristics based on an input list to try and determine what the best common unit for various input units would be. So in this case, I've got a bunch of different temperatures. It will standardize those to degrees Fahrenheit based on the input range of uh, these various units. We can also look at more complicated expressions. In this case, we have a number of compatible units, um, and it determines that farads per, or pascals per farad is the appropriate unit for the range. In addition, oftentimes when you convert something into its SI base units, unless you're familiar with that, you may not necessarily know that this is the standard of acceleration of gravity squared divided by coulombs, because it's not necessarily representing uh, a normal physical uh, quantity that you're, that you're familiar with. Unit simplify essentially does the inverse. It will look at the components of a compound unit expression and try and reduce those into a single unit wherever possible, and if not, into the simplest compound unit expression. So here we get watts per pascal squared. Unit, they're, they're distinct because they have different intentions. Um, and okay. Mm -hmm. I apologize, I wasn't hooked up to the internet when I initialized this. So we've also integrated unit discovery in Wolfram Alpha, so we can do things like control equals 9m, it will query Wolfram Alpha, and uh, right now this is running a little bit slow just because of the connection we have running through. And we'll interpret that as nine meters. Um, this is very useful for things, especially when it comes to physical qu constants, because something like vacuum permittivity is also the same thing as the, electro the electric constant, and that may not immediately strike you when you're trying to, to look for it. So being able to tie into the interpretation system we built with Wolfram Alpha makes this unit system much more extensible, and it makes it something that we can work with people based on whatever you know abbreviations they're familiar with, whatever sort of unit systems that they're comfortable with working in, we can use the technology we've developed associated with Wolfram Alpha to actually improve and enhance this unit system in ways that other unit systems can't handle. Um, we can also use this inline interpretation function inside of uh, various functions. So I can convert the speed of light in plain text to meters per second and we'll get our result in terms of meters per second. Um, and these are just some additional examples. Again, I apologize for the latency uh, on my machine here. Uh, this actually works quite quickly when you're not hooked up through VPN. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, you can abort. There's also, th there's timeouts associated with queries to Wolfram Alpha so that if you do lose your connection, it won't run through. If you have no connection whatsoever, so if I go through and and query something like this. It's first gonna tell me that I can't, I don't, I'm not connected to the, uh, oops, that here. So I can't, I'm not connected to the internet right now, so I get my standard error message, and it also tells me that it can't interpret the unit specification of gravity, or Earth's gravity here. When I throw this back on, we run through, and you'll notice a second query is instantaneous because we actually cache these results. So if you're gonna say m divided by s per meters per second rather than looking it up every single time, once we interpret that, we keep track of it, it's saved in the system cache, so in the future you can just refer to m divided by s and we know it's meters per second. Um, and so some different examples here, I went ahead and, and 
uh, evaluated these ahead of time just to save us a little bit. So uh, the Wolfram Alpha function also will return quantities. So if I ask for the Mathematica parse, it will give me back the uh, canonical representation of it. Distance to moon, if we ask for the results, we'll get the result of that returned. It's uh, 224,000 miles. Uh, we can also return uh, one of the interesting units that people oftentimes don't associate with unit systems is currency. Um, and currency is an interesting problem because it's dynamic. We can't have a table of values that says a unit is a, or a dollar is 1.2 euros because that, that value fluctuates constantly. Mathematic already has a financial data system which allows us to tap into those live currency feeds and so we can integrate that functionality directly into the unit system which is very powerful. Because in many unit systems, we don't handle currencies because it's too hard to say, okay, a foot plus a euro is just going to stay unevaluated because I don't know what the value of either of these is. It changes too often. So, so you're rather. Saying, <laughs> if the GDP of France is measured in euros and the ratio between the euro and the, and the dollar was to change dramatically and you were to evaluate the same thing, you'd get a different answer. Yes. It's going to be based on, on the real-time data that uh, Wolfram Alpha provides us in this case. Um, we also have this tied in, so if you use a larger query in this case, I'm asking about alder, which is a species of wood. I can go to the physical properties here and say, I would like the, either the quantity data, which will return me just the quantity objects associated with this, or I can also query for the computable data, which will include labels as well as the quantities uh, that are contained within them. Uh, and just for time's sake, I'm going to skip evaluating these uh, querying alpha, but here's an application example where I can ask Wolfram Alpha for physical information about different kinds of hardwoods. So in this case, I can ask for density information about a list of different hardwoods uh, that are provided here. Uh, and then I can retrieve that density information from the results returned by Wolfram Alpha, and I can throw those directly into a visualization so I can see visually how these different species of wood uh, compare in terms of density. As a hobby, I'm a woodworker, and oftentimes finding information like this is extremely difficult to do. If you're trying to find different substitutions between different species, other than looking on a woodworking forum where someone said, oh, you can replace hard maple with purple heart, there's not a lot of information. And crawling through material science databases to find things like Danka hardness or uh, radial shrinkage or elasticity is pretty difficult. That data is already curated and standardized within Wolfram Alpha, and being able to pull that back and immediately visualize it is a very powerful thing. But beyond just using Wolfram Alpha, we can also pull down information from different data sources. So for this example, I'm using a different data source, the Wood database, that uh, not only pulls, not only contains information about different units, it also or different physical properties of them, it uses a different unit value. The ability of Mathematica to standardize that information to common units, using common units is very nice for reference. I can immediately look and see where the variance is, but I can also visualize this quickly using list plot. So I can see the general trend is common between these two data sources, but there's some differences. Those may be accounted for in different testing methodologies. If there's a constant scaling difference, then that indicates that there's a slight uh, variance here. I can also transpose these to see we've got a generally linear relationship, but then I can also do something like compute the correlation of the different data sets and see that my correlation coefficient is very good. So these are probably closely related and potentially interchangeable data sets as long as I mind some of the outliers. Uh, and again, I'm going to have to wait on questions for just a little bit um, just to try and get through some of these. But we've also integrated this with various numerical and symbolic functions like solve. So here, this is basically a unit conversion operation to find how many meters are in a yard. But we can also solve for unknown variables. And by using dimensional analysis, we can determine that for x to satisfy this equation, it needs to be represented in terms of seconds squared per meter to cancel out into, into milliseconds. We can also work on 
a system of equations. So here's a more complicated relationship where we have a number of unknown variables. We can programmatically determine what the units associated with each of those are. And in this case, I can simplify them down again and know that uh, these are both, both of our p-values here are representations of watts per second. We also have integration with integrate. Um, so we can compute a definite integral of with relationship to units, and we can also compute symbolic definite integrals or indefinite integrals as well. <laughs> Which is a very non-trivial problem, by the way. Uh, we can also compute multiple integrals. So in this case, we're taking the double integral with respect to both time and length, and we get back our result in terms of feet cubed. As well, we have integration with numerical functions such as find root, we're able to determine, you know, in this case, we're looking at a dimensionless value inside of a quantity, but we can look at a more complicated problem, such as finding the amount of time it takes for a falling body to hit the ground using standard acceleration of gravity as a factor. We can use dsolve to set up our equation or our expression and use find root with a starting value of one second to know that this body will hit at 4.5 seconds. Uh, Similarly, find maximum can be used. In this case, we can find the maximum height of a body that's shot vertically with accounting for dampening as well. And we can, see not all, we can see what the maximum height is and the time at which it reaches that height. Uh, I'll skip over data analysis. We've integrated with statistical functions and various filtering functions to give us a robust system that respects the units associated with each value and gives you appropriate units on the output. So we can compute the mean or median of uh, a list of quantities. We can also look at things such as covariance, correlation we already looked at, um, various descriptive statistics. I'm going to jump forward to an application example that has to do with uh, dimensional analysis. In this case, we're looking at the Buckingham Pi theorem, which I don't have time to explain in detail, but it's essentially a special case of non-dimensionalization, which allows you to take a number of terms, so in this case we have pressure, dynamic viscosity, velocity, characteristic length, and mass density, and say, assuming that I hold pressure and dynamic viscosity to constant powers, so pressure times viscosity times these other terms to unknown powers, what is the relationship between these two systems? This is a application that's you. This is something that's used in fluid dynamics, for example, to work on scaling problems. I have an airplane that I know is 60 meters long. I need to test and see what its performances are going to be under ma maximum stress conditions. It's not realistic to test that inside of a wind tunnel because I don't have a wind tunnel that large. What can I do to scale this down but accurately represent the forces that are being exerted on the airplane? So. Uh, in this case, we're computing a matrix formulation here that's telling us the relationship of the different terms that would allow us to scale. So in this case, we can see that as long as the two have constant pressure divided by velocity squared times our mass density, then we have an accurate representation. And this allows us to compute all of the possible non-dimensional co uh, combinations associated with that particular problem. So it's something that's very powerful, and it's a common problem that's used across different disciplines. Uh, here's another example I'll run through where suppose we have a cylindrical uh, or, or a conical uh, vat, and we have a known coefficient of discharge, and we know the size of the object. We want to know how large of a hole needs to be placed inside of it for it to discharge its entire constants within a given time period. This is a problem that can be solved a number of different ways, one of which is through integration. And so what we'll do is we'll create an integral uh, that represents the uh, area at a, any specific height. And we can use, we can insert our units as part of this, including our standard acceleration of gravity. And we can use integrate to compute the two different sides of our equations and then use solve to actually determine what the diameter for that orifice would be in order to discharge within the given amount of time.